Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second panel of the ECB Forum on Banking Supervision. With an excellent lineup of speakers, we will discuss in the coming 75 minutes the very topical issue of climate change, are banks and supervisors prepared? As a quick introduction, I want to remind everyone today that only a few years ago, the discussion was still very much focused if and why climate change is relevant for central banks and supervisors. So today I'm so pleased that we see we shifted the discussion to how well are banks and supervisors prepared. So after a summer where we have witnessed so many natural disasters with heat records, wildfires and floods, we are already confronted with the impact of climate change. And the climate summit of the COP26 that is going on in Glasgow today uh, and still this coming week, this will also hopefully lead to strong commitments of governments to, to transition our economy to net zero. All of this will impact, have an impact on the financial sector, on the work of banks and supervisors. So I'm very looking, much looking forward to discuss this topic with the panelists today. Let me introduce them. We have Sarah Breeden, the Executive Director for Financial Stability Strategy and Risk at the Bank of England and a member of the Financial Policy Committee. I also want to mention that Sarah has been the Bank of England representative at the network of central banks and supervisors for greening the financial system, the NGFSS. And she has been leading the pioneering work on climate scenarios. I think you could almost say she's like the, the founding mother of the scenario, climate scenarios. <laughs> uh, secondly, we have Sonia Gibbs. She's a managing director and head of the Sustainable Finance Institute, uh, fi Sustainable Finance at the Institute of International Finance. I have known Sonia for some years now, and I can say that she really played a key role in getting climate change on the agenda of the IIF and really helping its members progress on this theme. Then we have Isabel Matas Ilago. She's the managing director of BlackRock, global heads of its firm's official institutions group, and a member of its geopolitical risk steering committee and global operating committee. You probably all have seen the 2021 letter to CSO from Larry Fink, where climate change was really the main theme. So I'm very much looking forward to hearing from Isabel the broader market perspective on climate change and the relevance it has for the financial sector. Then we also have Frank Alderson on this panel. Uh, he has been a member of the executive board of the ECB since December last year and vice chair of the ECB supervisory board since February 2021. Given the topics of today's panel, I also like to mention that Frank has been the chair of the NGFS since its inception uh, four years ago. And ever since the membership have grown from eight to 100 members uh, last week. Uh, so this group has really taken, uh, taken up its membership and its role in globally. And besides, Frank also co-chairs the Basel Committee Task Force on Climate Risk. So what is the program of, for the coming 75 minutes? Uh, we will first to discuss with the pe panelists the current state of play. Secondly, we will look ahead what is needed to, to really set uh, next step and the progress for bank and supervisor on addressing climate change. And besides, we would also like to hear from you. So we'll have a poll question between the first and the second part. And we have a Q&A at the end, as is mentioned by Connie already. So please put your questions already if, in the chat if you have them. So let's get started. What is the current situation? Are banks and supervisors prepared? Sarah, we're, I want to give you the floor first. How are banks prepared in the UK? And what has been the Bank of England's approach in getting banks ready? Thanks, Irene. And it is a real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And it's a really timely question uh, for us here at the Bank of England. We brought in supervisory expectations for managing climate change back in April 2019. We have told UK firms that they need to have embedded those expectations by the end of this year. And we've just published a report that sets out where firms are and where we are going to take our supervision uh, from here. So it's a, a great opportunity for me to give you uh, the headlines. I summarize uh, that the firms have made good progress, but there's a lot 
further to go. And some firms are showing more ambition than others. The supervisory expectations that we brought in cover governance, risk management, scenario analysis and disclosure. And we've seen a step change in board and senior management attitudes to climate change. It isn't in the corporate and social responsibility box anymore. It is firmly a strategic issue. And we saw that in COP last week with uh, so many financial institutions signing up to the Glasgow Financial Alliance for uh, Net Zero. But what's clear is, while that's great in terms of strategic ambition, further investment is required to embed climate change in business as usual risk management. Data is a challenge and is always said to be, but what we've seen is that there are some firms out there that are being creative in how they use the data that does exist in order to make progress more quickly. So what we're trying to do is encourage firms to continue to be strategic and, and ambitious, but use judgment expertise and all the tools available to make uh, this a part of how they make every single uh, decision. How are we helping them uh, get ready uh, at the Bank of England? The first thing we're doing is setting deadlines. People react uh, to deadlines. Those deadlines come in our supervisory expectations. They also come in our climate biennial uh, exploratory uh, scenario, kind of the climate uh, stress test that we're doing. We're also sharing best practice. We have a climate financial risk forum that's a public private partnership that aims to share best practice in order that no one has the excuse that they don't know how to manage climate related risk and i'd encourage everybody on uh, this listening to this to have a look at what the cfrf have produced there's draft risk appetite statements in there really fabulous summaries of the data uh, that are available and, and through our own communications through Dear CEO letters, we're highlighting what good practice uh, looks like. We're underlining the need for ambition and creativity. Roughly right is okay. Precisely right when it's too late is not a good uh, outcome. And then the final thing I'd say, Irene, is we're practicing what we preach. We are managing our own balance sheet with climate change uh, uh, as a factor and we are disclosing. And so having gone through the process ourselves as a bank, uh, we are able to understand some of the challenges and how to be creative in meeting them. But anyway, bottom line, great progress, but loads more to do. Thanks so much. Uh, I think I uh, all recognize that. I think I hear a bit of echo. Is it better? Oh yeah, it's better now or not? Okay, I'll give it another part. Yes, it's good now. Thanks so much, Sarah. And uh, I think what I take from your uh, intervention, it's that it's maturing, it's getting more serious, it's it's on the board agendas, but it needs to be addressed really in the heart, in the day-to-day -day business lines. And, and setting deadlines and sharing practices is uh, a good way to motivate. Uh, Sonia, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you. What is, what is your view on the preparedness of banks? And, are supervisors intervening too much or too little? And what areas would need further guidance? Thank you so much, Irvine, and thanks to the organizers for including the IAF here. I wanted to, to say up front that our the, what I'm going to say broadly reflects the views of IIF members around the world and that we've got 450 members in, in 70 countries, including many in emerging markets. So it's been a, a really interesting time of exploration for us all. Just three points on the preparedness of banks. First, uh, that climate risk is increasingly embedded in bank business models, as Sarah mentioned, and banks see client engagement and financing the transition as key elements of climate risk management. Second, that the toolkit for climate risk analysis, management and reporting is really evolving rapidly uh, with scenario analysis as an increasingly used tool and quite distinct from, from stress testing. 
And third, there's growing potential, clearly, for supervisory intervention on climate risk and in areas like transition plans and portfolio alignment. And such interventions should be carefully calibrated and ideally aligned across jurisdictions. So the, on the first point, banks being increasingly attuned to climate risk, I wanted to mention we did a 2021 survey with EY on chi of chief risk officers and found that over 90% of bank chief risk officers view climate change as the top emerging risk over the next five years. And half of them think it needs their urgent attention over the next 12 months. And that is such a change from just in, in 2019 when less than 20% of CROs saw climate risk as an urgent priority. The banks we talk with are increasingly actively undertaking internal scenario analysis, committing to, to net zero goals and working very closely with clients on their environmental impact and not just developed uh, country banks, but emerging market banks as well, which is really rewarding to see the effort here. So client engagement, financing the transition, those are becoming fundamental tools to help banks to, for banks to help quantify and mitigate climate risk. And both of these, of course, have been big themes at COP26. So effective engagement, supporting clients in transition do two important things. First, they provide banks with the information they need about supply chain risks. And second, they mitigate transition risk by helping turn the brown to green. So my second point here is that the toolkit for climate risk management is developing rapidly. And we did a stock take this year of scenario-based climate risk management practices with 20 major global banks. We find that banks as well as supervisors are conducting scenario analysis to bring future climate risks and opportunities to today's business models. So it's a real shift in thinking. Industry and supervisory goals are ultimately aligned to enhance risk management practices and promote better strategic thinking on climate risk management. And most of the banks that we surveyed are already using climate scenario analysis for internal risk management as input to the strategy component of their TCFD disclosures and to inform corporate decision making more broadly. We see a lot of peer to peer engagement here, which is very interesting. You know, banks are normally quite competitive about their their practices, but there's a great deal of information sharing and knowledge building here. And of course, the NGFS climate scenarios are emerging as a common reference. 40% uh, of the banks in our survey already use the phase one scenarios and even more will be utilizing phase two. So my last point here is on supervisory intervention. You know, you ask too much, too little. Supervisors can offer clear guidance and expectations on how banks should approach climate change. They can promote alignment of market practices with jurisdictional frameworks like the TCFD, now also the Task Force on Nature Related Financial Disclosures too. Supervisors can create platforms for capacity building and public-private collaboration, like the new International Sustainability Standards Board will do on disclosure. And critically, supervisors can drive international collaboration and alignment. But just a note of caution here, while scenario analysis and disclosure standards are very helpful tools, our bank membership broadly believes that climate-related regulatory capital requirements are not appropriate at this time, given the long time horizons the evolving science and analytical tools, the data gaps and risk of unintended consequences. So looking ahead, plenty of guidance welcome in, in different areas on the technical elements of forward looking risk assessment, on a common international approach to the design of supervisory exercises. Goes without saying, we need better availability and quality of data, though that mustn't slow us down, as, as Frank has often said. And on a related note, we need better climate reporting from real economy firms to support bank risk management. And finally, we need a clear link between climate risk assessment and portfolio alignment, which will help form the basis for transition plans. I'll stop there, Irene, thanks. Thank you so much, Sonia. It was uh, good to hear that it's uh, also at the financial sector, they're really making progress to hear the 90% uh, uh, percentage that chief risk officers uh, see this as a the theme for uh, now already uh, to address climate change. I think this is a, a very strong development and just emphasizes that uh, the topic is growing and growing in importance and rightly so. Uh, so I would like now, now like to move to Isabel um, to hear the market perspective. So where do we stand in tackling climate change and biodiversity loss via financial 
via the financial markets and our efforts and pay sufficient. Thank you very much, Marine. Uh, good morning to all. It's, uh, it's a real pleasure to, to take part in this, uh, in this panel with uh, such uh, inspiring uh, leaders in this, uh, in this field. Can you hear me? Sorry, Isabel. I think there is something wrong with your sound, or am I the only one? No. 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 Okay. Uh, uh, let's see what we could do in, about this. Uh, sorry for this. Uh, could you try one more time, maybe? Uh, I think it's not fixed yet. Uh, what we could do is I move to Frank first and we try to get this fixed. Would that be uh, good? Because it would be uh, too bad if we don't hear what you say. Um, so uh, Frank, can I give you the floor then first on uh, I think the ECB published its supervisory guide last year, uh, just like what uh, Sarah said with expectations, uh, where should we go? What are the main takeaways on the preparedness of banks based on the results of a self-assessment that took place uh, last year? Are there any good practices you have seen? Well, th thanks a lot, uh, Irene, and, and sorry to Bell that now suddenly uh, the order has changed. I thought it was very good that I would speak uh, as the only male in this panel at the very end. Uh, but, uh, you know, technique, technique stands be, be, be between good manners. Uh, but, um, but, but a great to be on this panel. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, uh, you ask about what the ECB is doing. Uh, before I get to that, let me just, you know, celebrate a couple of things that, that, that Sarah and, and Sonia have said. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely clear that, um, you know, some page has been turned. Uh, I was at the COP uh, last, uh, last week and uh, there were many CEOs of the world's biggest financial institutions and they would not have necessarily been there uh, in, in former COPs. Uh, so this is, I think, this on the lines that people understand that this is crucial, that this will not go away and that there is an incredible amount of urgency uh, to this question. So I think that is, that, that, that is, that is very good. Now, um, uh, but as uh, Sarah said, and I think Sonia also, there is still so much work uh, to be done. There is still a lot to be learned. There is still a lot of capacity uh, that needs uh, to be built. And all these, all these curves, these learning curves, uh, they need to be very steep because of the extreme urgency of the climate crisis that we are already in today. Um, now, what has the ECB done? As you rightly said, Irene, we published a, uh, um, uh, a guide with uh, supervisory expectations in terms of uh, climate and environmental risk management last November. We asked the banks to self-assess against these, um, these expectations. Uh, we asked the banks then on the basis of the self-assessment to come up with action plans. We engaged with the banks. We gave them feedback, all the banks uh, uh, in, in, in feedback letters. And actually in some weeks time, we'll, we'll indeed, and uh, you know, we are a little bit, because some weeks behind the Bank of England, uh, uh, we will publish uh, a report on the findings of these self-assessments. Um, there, there's, there's more going on, so I will come back to that, that to, to the outcome of the self-assessment in a second. There's more going on because, you know, as you might know, we also did a macro stress test, a climate-related stress test, some some time ago. Next year, we will uh, run a um, a micro uh, prudential um, and bottom-up uh, stress test. We just published the methodology of that. So there's a whole range of, of activities that show um, that um, also this uh, this supervisor, the SSM, takes this very seriously. It's one of our top priorities, and um, and banks will notice in all these various activities that we that we continuously press. Uh, press press on the importance of this. Now, in terms of the self-assessments, I think that the very good news is that banks have been very, very open and very sincere. Um, so I think this is very much to be applauded. Um, I don't think there has been any any greenwashing, if you like that, that, uh, that if, if you allow me to use that term, in, in, in their assessing uh, where they stand. So I think that is very much to be applauded. That's the good news. The, 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 the bad news is, is that actually none of the banks are under our supervision is, is even close to 
uh, complying with all our all our um, expectations. So there is still a lot of work to be done. We do see good practices and, and we will share those in this report that we will publish in some weeks time. Um, and the good news there is that we see good practices in different banks, different business models and different geographies. So this tells us that this is possible, that uh, it's not some kind of like an impossible ambition that we put there. It's possible, it can be done. Uh, but uh, as I said, none of the banks uh, is close to, um, to, to complying with all our expectations. So there is clear uh, work, uh, work to be done. Now, uh, maybe uh, with my head on, as uh, you introduced me like that as well, as the chair of the NGFS, maybe to also say that this is now indeed, and you mentioned this in your introduction, Irene, um, there is actually no supervisor, no regulator around the world that still uh, uh, doubts whether they have a role to play. That um, I think that it is now so clear that we all understand that this is within our mandate, that we need to help banks uh, to make this, this change to incorporating um, um, uh, climate change and environmental change in their risk management to grab the opportunities and to, and this is maybe the last point I want to make at this point, to align their balance sheet with a Paris compatible uh, Paris compatible transition path. Because I think this is really the, the, the buzzword that came out of the COP. The, uh, Sarah, you already mentioned the, the GFANS, the Glasgow uh, Financial Alliance on Net Zero, the commitment that an increasing number of banks and financial institutions more generally make voluntarily to, uh, to have a Net Zero balance sheet by 2050. Now that is very important in and on itself, but of course 2050 is still, what, what might it be, four, five, six CEOs down the line. So the, I think the, the teeth of this GFANS um, um, initiative is not just this commitment by 250, but also the intermediate commitments to have five-year intermediate uh, transition plans and the commitment to then annually report on the progress towards these intermediate goals with clear KPIs. Now, I think that is key. It's key in, in making sure that, that, that the financial system actually greens uh, together with the, with the broader economy. Uh, there is a clear causal relationship, of course, there cannot be a green financial system in a, in a non-green world, but also the other way is true. The world cannot green without the financial system playing its role. So only because of that, I think it's key, but it's also key for banks to manage their risks and to actually grab the opportunities. And maybe to close off here, I think it is, as I said, very much to be welcomed that there is this voluntary initiative. Uh, but I do think here in the, EU, uh, the, in the EU, it would be very helpful if this were to be backed up by a legal requirements for all banks to have pairs compatible transition plans, because this would actually uh, enhance um, the pressure, uh, but also help us as a supervisor to play our role. And, and let me uh, let me let me let me stop here for 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 this moment. Thank you, Irene. Thank you so much. So really like turning the page. Uh, I think that's what I hear you say, uh, but we're not there yet. And uh, it's, it's good. We'll, it's a bit of a teaser to the poll question we'll be uh, having in a minute, in a few minutes uh, on transition plans. Uh, but first, I, I want to, ho I really hope that uh, Isabel is well connected because I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, I hope so too. Can you hear me okay now? Yeah, yes, much okay. better. Great. Wonderful, wonderful. So good morning, everybody. And uh, it's uh, a great pleasure to, to, to join all of you on this uh, on this panel. So listen, I, I, I frankly agree with everything that's been said before. Uh, the way we see it, there's been a, a, an absolute sea change really in the last two years in number one, recognizing that climate risk is investment risk. And, and macroeconomic risk, frankly, in many cases. Uh, and number two, accepting responsibility, accepting at least some responsibility for uh, the outcome, for whether as a, as a world, we will indeed uh, manage to avoid catastrophic damage. And, and, and these two steps, uh, uh, frankly, are, are huge ones. Um, and we've seen this uh, uh, manifested itself in, 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 in three ways. First is target setting. You, you've all mentioned the, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, 
460 institutions, uh, 130 trillion or so of uh, of assets that are now committed to uh, down the road be aligned to uh, to a net zero outcome. That's remarkable. Equally remarkable, Frank. I'm surprised you haven't mentioned this because this is all your your doing, or at least you deserve a lot of credit for this. A uh, hundred uh, central banks and supervisory institutions that are now a member of the NGFS and that have over the recent weeks uh, published uh, commitments to play their part. Uh, and that part will vary according to the institutions, but to play their part in uh, delivering the right climate outcomes. So target setting is, is key. The second area where we're seeing this, uh, this, this changes in flows, when you look at the, the, the flows of, of, of capital uh, being allocated uh, to, the, to the asset management industry over the past year in, in EMEA, almost half of them were, went to sustainable strategies, which is extraordinary. So the, the, the pickup in the pace of capital being allocated to, uh, to sustainable strategies is, is several orders of magnitude what it was just, just a couple of years ago. And that's obviously very meaningful. Uh, because then it starts influencing the cost of capital of, of, of companies based on whether they themselves are aligned to um, sustainable uh, climate outcomes or not. Uh, and, and the third area where we've seen this sea change is in data availability. Uh, today, something like 85% of firms in the S&P 500 dispose some kind, that disclose sorry, some kind of climate metrics. Uh, firms supporting the uh, TCFD now exceed 2,000. It's, it's more than a doubling again in the last couple of years. Um, and uh, more and more of these firms not only support the TCFD, but actually report consistent with uh, its disclosure framework. So, so no question that's, that's a sea change. And, and, and the data point is a really big one because um, until recently, this was really a major hurdle to uh, integrating climate consideration into into the management of financial risk. And and now, if anything, there's a there's an overabundance of data. There's there's tens of thousands of data points that can be that can be looked at, that can be incorporated. And if anything, this creates a challenge in and of itself, or or an opportunity for those who can who can manage it. Um, Having said that, uh, and here I would really uh, agree with what uh, both well, all the previous speakers have said, we're in the very early stages of this necessary evolution, and, and, and progress is not even across geographies and across and across sectors. So, you know, when you when you poll big global asset owners and, and ask them like what share of their assets are allocated or managed sustainably or, you know, and then aligned with climate targets, um, roughly three quarters still are not. Uh, and, and, and Europe is far ahead on this. So, so you know, if you take a global perspective, it, 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 it's even less. Um, ESG integration in, uh, in, 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 in banks, I mean, there's been some, some ECB work on this, the TCFD itself. Yes, it's beginning to happen, but again, it's very much at its infancy. For us, this is one of the five priority engagement topics that we ask about uh, in, our, in our stewardship activities um, with, with all the firms that we're invested in globally. And what's very clear uh, is that, you know, most firms are only just beginning to set the right governance structure at board level, at management level, to, 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 to cope with climate risk. Most banks at the early stages of setting their strategy, deciding whether they're gonna exclude certain sectors or certain types of profiles of firms, um, and then risk management and uh, collection of uh, uh, monitoring of climate metrics, target setting, all this is being done really on a, on a, on a very pilot basis, if at all. Um, and that's okay because it's hard to do, and there's a lot of learning to do. So this is not to say um, this is not to say um, we, we should be depressed about the state of play. One thing that's of course very challenging for the financial sector as a whole to embrace this climate agenda is that the bulk of the emissions 
um, is, is scope three, right? I mean, most banks or asset managers or insurance companies don't emit uh, a lot of uh, carbon by their own activity. It's, it's really all about the activities that they enable through their provision of financing. And so, in a way, the, the data set can only be as good as, as that of the, uh, the companies invested in. But be that as it may, the direction of travel is, uh, is highly encouraging. The last point I would say is um, uh, progress is not, is not even across the board. Uh, in terms of geography, uh, Europe, in which I include the UK for the purposes of this discussion, is clearly ahead. Uh, and I think, again, credit to um, uh, supervisor and, uh, and, uh, and regulatory pressure that has been, frankly, way ahead of, of, of the rest of the, of the world. The rest of the world is, is stepping in, but it's a long journey. And obviously, the sooner you start, the, 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 the more advanced you are. Uh, Secondly, there is a, a, a clear and I would say growing gap between public companies, publicly listed companies and private markets. There's been enormous uh, regulatory emphasis on the, the publicly listed companies, much less so on the private markets. This is a risk. This creates an arbitrage risk. And of course, the size of the private markets is uh, uh, constantly growing. So. It, it, it's really important from, from our standpoint to, to take a whole system view of this. Otherwise, we're just going to see the, the, the polluting assets migrate from one part of the system to, to another. And then thirdly, uh, and, and this hasn't been touched upon so much, but in the title of the, of the panel, I believe there was a reference to biodiversity. Uh, or perhaps more broadly, what we call natural capital, which include biodiversity, deforestation, and then water resources protection. Uh, it is part of the picture, but it's much harder. Um, certainly for, for us, again, in our, in, our, in our engagement with the companies we invest in, this is uh, absolutely something we, uh, we look at wherever it is uh, material. Uh, and, and by the way, the, the WEF estimates that over half of global GDP is either moderately or highly dependent on, on natural capital. So this is not this is not a small issue, but it's a lot harder to measure. Uh, when it comes to carbon emissions, well, it's easy what you have to measure. It's carbon emissions. It's uh, uh, for uh, for natural capital. The the, the, the metrics are, are are not as standardizable, and and it's a lot more qualitative. So uh, just to say, it, it it needs to be part of the picture. We 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 certainly uh, do everything we can to make it part of the picture, but uh, but it's but it's even harder than for than for carbon emissions. So um, let me stop here and maybe come back in a future round about what, what, what's needed to accelerate progress further. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, and also for the people behind the screens for fixing your uh, connection, because it was really a pleasure listening to you. Uh, it's, it's, it's good that you already sketched a bit the challenges, because I think there are uh, really some ahead of us. And I think this is also a nice bridge to the to the second round of this panel. But what I really liked is that you said people are, or firms are recognizing the risk, but also accepting a responsibility, because I think this is really, be, will be really key to, to move forward on this theme. Okay, before we move to our next round uh, to hear, okay, what are the next steps? Let us let us move to the poll and let us hear from, from you. Uh, the question we have put up is, uh, what is the next step for banks to set up net zero transition plans? Frank already referred to it, others as well. Transition plans was really the buzzword in Glasgow. Uh, and also uh, the European Commission included uh, uh, transition plans in the CRD, CRR uh, proposal that was uh, recently published. So the poll question is, what, it, what are the next steps? Is it enhancing client engagement? I think Isabel said it's not only, uh, what, how do you include the scope three for financial firms? I think it's utmost important that we have a great uh, banks have a good view of uh, how clients are working on this uh, the second uh, option in the poll is hire experts uh, and train staff uh, well there's a few a lot of knowledge and things to explore on this so that's the second one the third one is join the net zero banking alliance this is part of the so-called gfans a forum to accelerate the transition to net zero 
and already 450 financial firms across 45 countries and they are responsible for assets of 130 30 trillion so dollars so that's a lot um, so client engagement experts higher expert and uh, staff join the net zero banking alliance or all of the above so i'm curious to see um if we have the poll results in already uh let me quickly check in the chat no not yet uh but then i, I give you some time to uh think about it because i think this is this is really important transition plan is is really um uh, key what Frank said, not only what are you doing, what is the CEO, uh, the fifth or the sixth uh, uh, CEO doing in like 30 years from now, but what are you doing in five years and how are you getting there uh, uh, to, to net zero? And how do, how, what is your plan to walk away from carbon? Okay, we have the results coming in. Uh, I'm really curious to see uh, uh, that the the winner is uh, all of the above so it's 61 percent and that i think really uh resonates i think with with all the messages the panelists have brought up so far it's we need actions on all fronts and uh, we cannot wait like uh first collect some um uh some more knowledge about it and then uh talk with your clients and then join a bank uh, the net zero banking alliance you know the the, the majority, 61% of the poll results say, let, let's go for all of the above. So, well, that's a, a great start to move up to the, to the next part of our panel. And that is, what are the next steps? Uh, Sarah, can I give you the floor again? Uh, how can we really push the system to where it should go? And how will the Bank of England contribute to that? Brilliant. Thanks, uh, Irene. And, and I would say the main thing that we are trying to do is encourage people to turn pages quickly, to learn to speed read so that the urgency of the situation is reflected in our actions consistent uh, with the poll uh, results just then. So the first thing that we're doing is shifting gear in our supervision of climate related uh, financial risks. We're no longer just about enabling uh, firms to uh, meet those expectations. In addition, through our active supervision, we'll be looking to ensure that our expectations are met. What does that mean in practice? It means we'll be asking uh, firms questions about how they are embedding it and uh, trying to ensure that the firms are being ambitious and using judgment, expertise, and creativity as they go about uh, uh, trying to size these risks. And importantly, what we'll be doing is using our supervisory toolkit, just as we do in all other aspects of our, our supervision. When things aren't where they should be and where more progress is needed, that ranges from requiring remediation plans to uh, thinking about whether uh, we need uh, formal reports uh, to us on where firms are potentially even uh, risk management and governance scalers and in extremists perhaps uh, enforcement but bottom line shifting gears through active supervision to ensure our expectations are met uh, the supervisory toolkit obviously includes capital and so what we have done is launch a debate on uh, capital. Capital is there to absorb uh, losses, uh, it's clearly uh, the consequences of climate change brings uh, the potential for losses and so what we are doing is starting a debate on how we might better use capital to support our aims. Uh, it's clear that it's partially able to capture the risk from climate change at uh, the moment, both in terms of how firms uh, assess their own capital, about the possibility of using uh, scalars where firms are not managing uh, risks well. But we're also looking to investigate kind of how capability gaps and regime gaps may mean that capital is not doing the job uh, that it should. Uh, sizing that is a complex task. 
we need to do it carefully because the unintended consequences could be significant but reflecting the urgency of this issue we've started a debate on it and that debate will happen uh, internationally as well third thing we're doing we'll be publishing our climate uh, bez uh, results later this year we hope that will shine a light on where these risks are likely materialize and the change that is required if the uh, financial system is able to steward uh, the real economy on its way uh, to net zero and the fourth thing we're doing Doing, picking up on the big theme, uh, understanding where firms are on their uh, net zero alignment, uh, ensuring that they're thinking about these issues. The UK government has said it, it will introduce them initially on a comply and transition plans on a comply or explain basis, and then over time consider moving to mandatory. As supervisors, what we'll be wanting to understand is who's got one of those, uh, who's, who's complied, who's explaining why, and importantly, is what they're saying consistent with what they're doing? And then as a financial stability authority, adding that up at the level of the system to see what's that, uh, what that's telling us about the likelihood of an orderly transition. And then perhaps the final thing to say, Irene, is that we'll continue to work internationally and with governments because this is a problem that we can only solve together we need to solve it as uh, other panelists have said all around the world not just in the uk not just uh, in europe so we'll be sharing our learnings internationally as we have done uh, to date but importantly as well working with government because much of this is driven by climate policy with elected governments in uh, the lead and i think we've an important role to play in facilitating the dialogue between the government the real economy the financial system and us as regulators of uh, the financial system uh, there's a huge amount to do uh, but as i said at the start this is urgent so we absolutely need to get on with it Thanks a lot, Sarah. So shifting gear, I think you really explained how you're going to do this and even starting the discussion on capital. I think then things becoming really serious uh, for everyone and uh, net zero transition plans are, um, it's good to hear also that at the UK it's moving towards uh, becoming a mandatory in a comply or explain uh, position. And the last bit I want to uh, mention is that Thanks for mentioning also the role of governments, because I think just to emphasize it, they have such an important role to play to really steer us uh, towards uh, uh, a global strategy on where how to reach net zero and uh, the whole society and economies on this. Um, so now I would like to move to Isabel. Um, so what changes, I think you already touched on a few, but what changes do you see that need to happen outside of the banking or financial sector to really uh, have have uh, help banks and supervisors to get prepared. Uh, yes, certainly. So uh, first of all, um, I think it's very clear that uh, the, the, the 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 supervisory expectations and their continued ramping up is uh, is paramount. Uh, and again, when you look at the you know uh, the the global panorama on this, it's very clear that uh, European and, and UK banks are ahead of the game. Why? Because their supervisors were ahead of the game in, in, in asking them to pay attention to, to climate risk. Uh, we very much hope that these uh, ramping up of supervisory efforts can happen in a globally coordinated way, which seems to be the intention, and that's very encouraging because obviously a lot of these groups are are global and it's important for them to um, to be able to to have a unified framework as much as possible. Um, obviously, talk of capital requirements. Uh, yes, it focuses the minds. Uh, that's for sure. But uh, uh, for us, it, it it makes us a little bit nervous as well, given um, how um, nebulous, frankly, the measurement of risk uh, in, in, in banks is at, at this stage. So it seems to us that, uh, that there's quite a lot of steps that need to come ahead of that in terms of, um, you know, gathering the right metrics and, 
and uh, and setting targets uh, and, and and so forth. And and certainly, it's it's very hard to do. We've been working for the past year our, ourselves on, um, you know, measuring the temperature alignment of our portfolios. There's lots of methodologies. You can come out in totally different places depending on the methodology. So um, and you know the same would be true for any bank trying to 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 do this. And so there's clearly a role also for supervisors in helping guide what's okay, what's not okay as a methodology, because right now it's, it, it, it's frankly a bit of an open field. Uh, and so some guidance there would be, would be helpful. But I think that the, the most important point here is uh, that I would make is finance cannot be the main, uh, the main enforcer. At the end of the day, most of the emissions are outside of the financial sector. They're in the real economy, and it's the real economy that needs to transition to a less uh, carbon intensive uh, model. And for that, we need the right policy incentives, uh, uh, both on the demand side and on the and on the supply side uh, of um, of energy consumption and 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 carbon emissions. And it, you know, it can be via tax. It can be via regulation. It can be uh, through 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 any means, but if it is not economically profitable to to do the right thing, uh, you know the financial sector will uh, will struggle to to um, to support that that effort towards towards net zero. Um, you know if you consider that according to the IMF, you know uh, fossil fuel subsidies are around six trillion dollars uh, annually. Uh, you know. This is why often it looks like carbon intensive activities are cheaper than the than the greener and cleaner equivalent. You know, until it remains more profitable to invest in in, in dirty uh, activities than clean ones, it, the, the role that finance can play is going to be is going to be limited. So right now, I think it's really important for everybody to to execute on the the great targets that they've announced, and that applies also to I would say mainstream government policy, so that we can all get to uh, way below two degrees of um, of global warming. And finance will respond to that because corporates will respond to that in the real economy, and then things will happen much faster. Thanks a lot, Isabel. Uh, policy incentives are indeed, uh, I think, a very important topic to to mention. And I'm also curious to hear from Sonia now to see. Okay, uh, I think Isabel mentioned something. That, well, before we move into the capital sphere, uh, we need measurements and metrics uh, and also the global uh, response. So uh, curious to hear from your uh, side, Sonia, what are really the next steps to, to set now? Such a good question, Irene, and, and gets to a common theme that's been running through our discussion today. You know, can we agree on how we should be assessing climate risk and opportunities? What are our goalposts? How do we measure them, both for risk management and to channel financial flows? And who's in charge of making sure that banks get there? So the short answer, I think, is that we really need to identify common elements of information that can be linked across both voluntary and regulatory initiatives aimed at disclosure, target and commitment setting, monitoring and evaluation, and ultimately capital allocation. And that's really a tall order, given the sheer number of frameworks that are trying to do this. Even if you leave aside the regulatory and supervisory initiatives, which there are plenty, there are jurisdictional approaches to steering the financial sector, uh, or not steering in some cases. There's also, of course, at GFANS and all of its component parts, a new expert group there that's going to roll up into the FSB, as well as the very wide range of frameworks supported by for example, philanthropic foundations and NGOs, uh, for example, science-based targets. So the bottom line is that we need to have a unified goal of driving real economy transformation, not just financial system resilience or portfolio decarbonization, although those are critical. Real economy levers that work across all sectors, like carbon pricing, disclosure mandates, or specific directives aimed at polluting sectors, those are gonna be the most effective complement to policies geared toward the financial sector. They work working hand in hand, as you say. And they'll also help the financial sector set targets and provide appropriate incentives to, to help banks reach their goals. 
So just going back to your metrics question, I think it's, it's, it's key to ensure that metrics are relevant, of course, to a bank's business model, strategy, and balance sheets. You got to work through the challenges of underlying data, and this is improving and changing very fast. Um, we need to ensure that the, the facts are, are consistently and credibly delivered. And ensure that I think that a range of metrics, and whether that might be reducing carbon intensity or an implied temperature metric or, or others, that this range is used for, for different purposes, you know, horses for courses, to avoid picking winners. And this is particularly true in areas like forward-looking alignment and analysis, where there are a lot of different views on, on what the right approach is. And banks, of course, will have clear views on which metrics makes most sense for their particular business model. But the key in measuring portfolio alignment, I think, regardless of metric, is going to be to judge whether a given portfolio really contributes to the fight against climate change. Will it have a real impact on greenhouse gas emissions? And one of the key question marks, of course, is who gets to decide that? So judging uh, portfolio alignment, I think that it, it will affect how capital is allocated. It brings in the whole taxonomy question, as well as engagement and stewardship, as, as mentioned earlier. And of course, all of this scrutiny is going to intensify reputational risks and, and concern about greenwashing. And that's why it's so critical that there be agreement on yardsticks internationally. In terms of targets, it's going to be tremendously helpful to kind of clarify the links between this you know, alphabet soup of, of commitment frameworks, uh, including uh, GFANS in particular, all the constituent alliances within GFANS and, and SBTI. The net zero frameworks, you know, Frank mentioned interim goals with these requirements and, and clear KPIs to keep firms in line with the goals and set accountability standards. These have got to be meaningful and ultimately influence actual emissions reductions in the real economy. And I wanted also to mention here the work of the Task Force on Scaling Voluntary Carbon Markets and its new governance body, the Integrity Council for Voluntary Carbon Markets. Just to note that high integrity carbon credits can be a very important complement to emissions reductions along the path to net zero, while also protecting natural capital and steering flows toward climate vulnerable emerging markets. And a last point on, on incentives you'd, you'd asked. There's a, clearly a whole range of incentives, and the key is, is that these be aligned. So financial firms help incentivize their clients and counterparties, and vice versa. You know, this, is, this shouldn't be underestimated, the, the degree to which clients incentivize banks to change. Clearly, there's the whole regulatory, supervisory, policymaker incentives for financial firms. And, you know, just to, to, to reemphasize the points that we've been making here, clear, real economy climate policies at the government level are ultimately going to drive transition from the bottom up, enabling finance to do the same. And banks, of course, are a key catalyst of change in the economy, but it's important not to overplay that card at the end of the day, as Isabel noted. And you too, Irene, that government policies are going to play the largest part in transitioning the economy. Thanks a lot, Sonia. And it's uh, good to hear like all the developments that are ongoing at the moment. And I, I realized if you really want to like be up to speed with everything it, it takes a lot of effort and i think this is uh also relates to the point that uh, sarah mentioned about like shifting gears right because this is what needed and i really hope that although there are like some unclarities that we can still move on uh because it's uh there, of course there are questions out there but i think it's the the topic is just too urgent to to slow down and see and wait for perfection i think this is also something that sarah said uh, at the start so frank um, i would like to move to you now so what are what do you see as next steps and really to address climate and environmental risk what is the ecb doing about that uh are transition plans that relevant uh what are what would could really help on this front Thank you, Irene, and, and, and thanks a lot again also to the fellow panelists, because I think, you know, very, very important points have been made. And I think we are all, all uh, you know, looking at the same same direction. Um, uh, maybe to just remind everyone who is looking um, of the urgency to start with. Um, um, one and a half degrees means 70% um, more of the floods and the fires and the droughts that we're seeing today. Two degrees means 200 to 300% more 
of the floods, the fires, and the droughts we see today. Today, we are not on a one and a half degree path. We are not on a two degree path. We are on a 2.7 degree path, and some think that is optimistic. Um, so that is um, just as a reminder for all of us where we are. Um, first point. Second point, um, I completely agree with all of you that in the end, this is going to be driven by governmental policies. Um, governments have signed up to the Paris Agreement, not central banks, not supervisors, not financial firms, not real economy firms, governments have. Um, so, so it's true that if um, uh, you know some people were to say that it should be the um, the financial sector policing the world moving to net zero, that is uh, beyond uh, what one can ask from the financial sector. Now, the financial sector is responsible for managing its climate and environmental related risks. That is clearly what needs to be done, and climate change, both in the physical, but certainly also in the transition aspects of it, is not something that will just start on the 1st of January 2050, because the Paris Agreement thought in terms of 2050. That is today. Uh, today, we are being confronted with cities that say we don't no longer want diesel cars. Today, we are confronted with building regulations all around the world saying that there should be um, um, uh, energy efficiency. So all these manifestations are today and this also means that these risks that we that we always refer to as climate related and environmental risk they translate into very traditional existing risk categories this is already something that has come out of the work of the basel committee so it feeds into credit risk it feeds into market risk and that is also um, looking at the future uh, without putting a concrete timeline on this but this is also why it is very um uh, very much in the logic of it all that in the end, of course, this will feed into uh, capital requirements because capital is there um, to uh, to be set against material risks, and these are material risks. Now, um, uh, that is uh, that 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 is a, 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 you know a former point, the, 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 an additional point I wanted to make. Um, some other reactions, maybe, to what has been said. I think um, uh, Isabel, you are so right in pointing out that this is beyond just the climate uh, sphere. We need to talk about um, uh, natural capital. We need to talk about biodiversity loss. Actually, there was a whole day uh, last uh, last week uh, in Glasgow dedicated to deforestation. There's a key role also for the financial sector to play. And what we cannot do is to now say, OK, you know what? We are very busy. There's many challenges. Let's face um, climate change for the next 10, 20, 30 years, and then afterwards we will, um, um, you know, um, uh, pay attention to some of the uh, other uh, pressing issues. That is just not a luxury we can afford. Uh, these risks are there. Uh, they will be manifesting themselves. They are manifesting themselves, and they need to be looked at uh, in uh, in their in their their more holistic uh, interaction uh, that they have. Uh, I was also thrilled to hear. Uh, um, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the representatives of the financial sector saying that actually in terms of data, we are moving or we have already moved to a situation in which there is an abundance of data. Now, of course, we need to um, to, 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 to harmonize. Taxonomies are, are very important. The NGFS is trying to do what it can in terms of uh, coming out with a data repository where you will have a website in which you can access in a in a dynamic way as many databases as there there are. Um, but um, it is it is no longer acceptable to just kind of like sing the old song of saying, you know, there's no data, there's no data. Um, and, you know, sometimes I challenge bankers into uh, to just, um, you know, make that point as well uh, when they say it. And, and then I ask, so did you at least make the list of things that, um, you know, abstracting whether this is already available or not or easily available or not, but the, the, the data sources that you would need, the data that you would need. And, and you know, I still speak bankers that, that have not, not done that, that basic homework and that is just not, not, not longer acceptable. I think in terms of um, uh, maybe uh, since you mentioned this, Isabel, uh, and I didn't want to be too uh, self-congratulatory here at all, but it is true that the now hundred, and actually we already received uh, another another application since that, um, but the now hundred supervisors and central banks around the world that are united in the uh, in the NGFS, um, it is true we have now committed 
uh, in a commitment that we published last week, but indeed there's also many of these individual commitments by individual members. This is significant. It's significant because it says something. It says something. This is no longer uh, something that is just a voluntary thing by, uh, by the willing uh, that are members of the NGFS. This is something that we now, we actually by committing say, this will not go away. This will not go away, and 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 you know I can just subscribe to what Sarah says in terms of you know how the um, how the SSM uh, looks at this. The time of awareness um, uh, creation um, is actually over. Um, you know the Paris Agreement was signed uh, six years ago. The Club of Rome uh, was uh, was active in the 70s. Uh, it's not that you know it is acceptable to say, well, you know, I've I've just started to think about climate change. This is very much here and now, and I think the role of supervisors is now to actually ensure that expectations are being met, ensure that uh, risks are being managed, ensure that uh, transition plans are increasingly going to be aligned with uh, climate policies. That, and that brings me back to the very beginning, um, that governments in the end will have to make, but will be increasingly making. Uh, because that is something that 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 we can be sure of. Um, maybe uh, one more element that uh, has not been mentioned, but which I think is a very important driver of transition risk, because we always think in terms of transition risk of governmental policies. But it is also, and I think this point was already made, stakeholders and clients of, uh, of, of financial firms that increasingly are just requiring this. And the last element that I want to put to that uh, which was already mentioned by Mark Carney in his uh, Tragedy of the Horizon speech, is the legal, the litigation risk, uh, which is out there. There is increasing climate and env environmental related litigation around the world, increasing successful uh, uh, climate related uh, litigation around the world. And this will also uh, put pressure, set deadlines, and create um, transition risk. Uh, but, um, you know, transition risk is also uh, a stark reminder that if you manage that uh, by uh, by moving uh, from um, you know a, a fossil related um, uh, balance sheet to a more uh, sustainable uh, 21st century ready uh, balance sheet and business model, you can also take all the opportunities that are out there. Over to you, Arne. Thank you so much, Frank, and and thanks for all the four panelists. And I think I really see. I feel the energy here, uh, see that we have to move up on this theme. Uh, and although the, we, there are many challenges everyone raised, but uh, the commitment to, uh, to address the issue, the urgency, uh, of course, uh, we, we would need some uh, other conditions. So if I think a bit about the urgency we are facing, I, can, I think I can say I'm conditionally hopeful because we need to have first the conditions filled as well, uh, but everybody's working on that. Uh, but still hopeful that uh, because of the energy I've been uh, getting from these panelists on things that are moving, that there is data, that uh, there are commitments on transition plans, that there are uh, developments on the legis uh, legislation front. Also, I think on the Basel Committee, it's good to emphasize that they are really working on um, on embedding it in the whole framework, Basel core framework. And this will hopefully lead to more uh, international convergence at this front. And the NGFS is, I think, really a big engine behind this to have all these supervisors worldwide working together on sharing best practices. So now we have, luckily enough, still time for a few questions. We had two coming in. I invite uh, participants to put in more. The first question is, and I think we touched a bit on this. Uh, the first question is, it seems to me, uh, this is from uh, Jose Maria Roldan. Uh, it seems to me that things will get messier before they get better. Improvement will happen in the coming years, but clustering banks by which banks are greener and which banks are browner might be a bit random until best practices are extended. How can supervisors navigate these, year of chaos, these years of chaos and how can banks do this? Uh, Sarah, can I give you the floor first to answer to this uh, question? The years, uh, navigating through the years of chaos. Um, so I think I'd be a bit more positive than that. I think we will have a period where firms are um, uh, progressing at different rates. That's what we've seen already 
in our analysis of where the UK banks and insurers are, as I said, there are some that are ambitious and are, are doing a better job now than others. Uh, and I think our role as supervisors is to get the laggards to be with the leaders uh, and to use a combination of stick and carrot, uh, the carrot being the sharing of best practice and the the, um, uh, the the kinds of products that the IIF have put out, that the uh, UK Climate Financial Risk Forum has put out that show uh, institutions how to do a good job of, of managing uh, these risks and use a combination of those carrots and sticks, which is the usual supervisory toolkit of requiring remediation plans of the laggards and being prepared to use the uh, the other sticks uh, uh, that we have at our, our disposal to encourage everybody uh, to, to catch up. So I don't know that I'd call it chaos. Uh, I would call it uh, a, um, a period of convergence uh, being required. There are a number of banks who for many years have run their businesses on uh, this basis. What we all need to do is work together to embed the toolkit and to embed these issues in every decision that's taken. And if I might make a final uh, point, which goes to the really, the underlying theme that there's been through the dis discussion, how the, uh, the financial system and the regulators of the financial system are a part of this, uh, of solving this problem, but not the only part. I think a really important part of what we need to do in the next few years is highlight where we need greater clarity on climate policy from governments, where greater technological change is required so that those issues can start to be addressed early. Uh, so I think it's incumbent on all of us to uh, embrace this with a, 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 an attitude of constructive engagement, recognize that kind of there are leaders and, uh, and laggards and work together to try and stop chaos happening and to um, uh, move us forward in as coordinated a manner as is possible given this is a profound economy-wide change. Thanks a lot uh, Sarah, I like the constructive engagement and I think you mentioned that uh, like supervisors have a role to to help like guide the sector in going there but it's also up to the sector, financial sector, the banks and supervisors to highlight to politicians on the guidance they will need to move forward on this. Uh, Sonia, what would your uh, outtake be on this one, on this question? Well, it's, a, it's a really interesting question, the, the years of, of chaos, and, and I, I agree with Sarah and would be considerably more positive on this because it's, it's ongoing as we speak, right? So first and foremost, sort of target setting with clear yardsticks, progress reports, you know, so it's a guide, you know, to help navigate through, through the chaos. Um, second, I, I really would emphasize peer-to-peer -peer engagement and bank-to-client engagement, leveraging all of this to develop the toolkit, because a toolkit that is sort of, if you will, open source, you know, and has input from a, a great variety of banks and financial firms around the world, plus the input from their clients, is going to be the most useful in, in steering us toward our, toward our goals. And finally, I think, you know, I'd, I'd highlight really honest and open dialogue between banks and their supervisors. And, and today is, is a really good example of that. It's happening all over the world in, in big forums, small forums. And I think it, it, it's really critical in moving us forward. And I think what's, what's interesting about this discussion today is it really reflects the degree of commitment and, and passion that, that we all share in, in getting to our these really urgent uh, goals on, on climate.
Thank, thanks so much, Sonia. We have one more question, and I see we're o almost running out of time. So if it's okay, I'll ask the question, the, the last question to Frank and uh, Isabel, uh, uh, because this is this is more on the uh, prudential framework. Um, uh, the the EBA, uh, the European Banking Authority, has a plan uh, aims to bring forward the assessment report on prudential treatment for ESG risk from 2025 to 2023. Is this timely enough, especially since results need to be translated into legislation, which will take more time? Do we lose this take decade? And if we do, uh, can we afford this? This is a question asked by Renee Smits. Um, Frank, can I give you the floor first on sure. this? Well, if you, if you think where we are, and you remember what I just said about the one and a half, two degrees, two, uh, two point seven degrees, everything that we do is way too late. We should have been doing this in the seventies or earlier, and we did it. But now we are where we are, and we need to just focus on on the future. And I think you know many uh, great ideas have been uh, have been uh, mentioned here. Um, I welcome the fact that the EBA has been asked to to speed up. Um, I think this is very important work um, because uh, you know this was a little bit implicit earlier, but let me be very clear. Um, uh, we as supervisors um, uh, don't like um, um, a capital framework that is not uh, risk-based. Um, so uh, before uh, you uh, you start uh, playing around and some of these ideas that you know are maybe no longer so much on vogue, but some 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 years ago, uh, many people talked about green supporting factors or, or non-green um, uh, penalizing factors. Um, um, uh, that is not the way we look at this. The way we look at it is that. Uh, we need to have a clear view on where the risks are. But if we have a clear view on where the risks are, then the logic of the whole uh, uh, Basel framework, uh, if you if you like, is uh, is indeed that this is reflected in in, in capital requirements in the end. Now, um, any work that's being done to get a clearer view on risk differentials, and I think that the work of the EBA is important, uh, is um, uh, is very much to be welcomed, and uh, and the earlier. Uh, real data are available, the better. And thank you uh, for, for this uh, this question. Thanks so much, Frank. Isabel, I think this is uh, very much in line with your earlier intervention on, on capital. Uh, what would your response be? I think you're on mute, uh, sorry. Oops. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, great. So fully agree with what, uh, with what, uh, Frank had just said, I, I would just add two things. One is, um, so uh, of course there is great urgency, uh, but it's really important to realize that not, you know, there shouldn't be a one size fits all approach. Banks have very different business models. Some have greater exposures to sectors that are more important from carbon standpoint. Some have greater exposure to emerging markets where the data challenges are, are, are much greater, et cetera. So, one should be cognizant of this, whether it's as a regulator or as an investor, one shouldn't expect the same thing exactly of every of every bank. They're not going to all be able to have the same path, and that's okay. That's, in fact, the essence of properly managing these risks. The other thing I would say, and sorry for going back again to the same point, but it's very hard to know what the risks are if you don't know if you're on a 2.7 degrees of global warming as some have been warning we are on the basis of policies in place today, or if we're on a 1.8 degrees of global warming, which is what you, where we are if you believe the pledges made at COP26, or, or somewhere in between. The, the range of outcomes is enormously different, and, and so the, the sooner we can get clarity on the policy path, the sooner the whole economy, both real economy and the financial sector, can, can measure and manage risk appropriately. Thanks so much. I think this is also in line with what Frank says, that it should remain risk-based uh, still, all the capital. This is like excellent timing. We're like 11.44 uh, CET. Uh, I really, really enjoyed discussing uh, this important topic with you. Uh, I hope you have inspired many participants today. Um, your messages did not only emphasize the severity of the challenges we face due to climate, climate risk and that action needs to be taken at all fronts. So politi polit politicians and uh, also financial sector, but also what we do, I think, in our daily lives. Um, but you have also helped us shed us some light on the road ahead. 
So let me end by using the quote of President Lagarde, uh, she included in the blog last week, uh, in the words of uh, Antoine de saint exupéry uh, the time for action is now, it's never too late to do something. So after these last words, I would like to thank the panelists one more time for the excellent contribution. Say goodbye to everyone and give the floor back to Connie. Thanks so much.